Hey everyone, my name is Will Taylor and I am doing the first in a series of videos that I'm going to call Under the Hood of a Song or Under the Hood of a Piece of Music. And these are geared toward folks that are uh, music students, music professionals. Um, if you're used to seeing my other videos where I'm talking about shows or uh, promoting, they're going to be a lot more low-key in energy. And I'm, I'm, I want to say a big thanks to Amy Nolte Music. If you look at Amy Nolte's uh, videos on YouTube, Google her. She's been the inspiration for doing this, and her videos are very calm. It's a way of looking through music, looking through songs, and sort of lifting up the hood and seeing how they're constructed underneath. So if you're a musician or if you're somebody who's uh, taking lessons, this is geared toward you. And this is the first one. I'm going to actually be going over two of my tunes that I've written, one in the last year and then one that I wrote about 22 years ago. And I'm actually going to show you the sheet music, and I'm going to go through it note per note and talk about what was going through my mind, what were my intentions of writing this piece, and maybe you can learn something about music if you're a budding composer or if you're just somebody who's interested in getting in my head. And I want to share these things with you. So thanks to Amy Nolte. This is the first one of this series. I'm just going to go for it, so bear with me. I'm going to try to take it slow rather than trying to always fill in the spaces. And it is a live video right now, so you can comment if you'd like. But more of these videos, um, this is going to be a sample, so I'm going to have a lot of these videos on my Patron Sustainer page. So if, you want to, if you're really interested in seeing more of these, I'm going to make a lot more of them available at stringsattached.bandcap.com for five bucks a month you can subscribe and you can get access to all of the videos that I'll be just constantly adding and adding and adding and adding but you can watch many of them for free just on my YouTube channel or on my Facebook page so uh, the first song we're going to talk about the first tune that I'm going to go over is called Choro Number no. 1 and this is a song that got started when I was just sitting with my guitar on the couch, fooling around, uh, sort of spaced out, kind of listening to people con having a conversation in the living room where I was. And my fingers, a lot of times, you know, what happens is you're, uh, when you're not paying attention, you start coming up with things on your instrument that are a lot more interesting than if you were trying to make something happen. In other words, some ideas just sort of rise up through your fingers, through your body, and on the instrument. And so this tune, uh, usually, well, this tune just got started with me kind of doodling around the guitar mindlessly. And then I found something that was interesting, and I thought, hey, let's develop that further. And so this tune's called Choro Number no. 1. I'm actually going to turn the camera onto the sheet music and show you uh, how I took that basic germ of an idea and created a whole piece of music. And so let's turn the camera here. And I'm going to zoom in on the music. So as you can see, this is Charo number one. <clears throat> now let's look at this really carefully here. So the first three measures, actually the first two measures are basically this, this, these, uh, this, if you can see this. Okay, so actually the, you know, just this part right here was where I was just kind of fooling around on the guitar this B, E, D sharp, E, and it has a very, you know, kind of a Spanish flavor to it. And this little half step motion, the E to the D sharp, hope everybody can hear me okay, is what kind of got me going because on the guitar you've got the E string open and you've got the D sharp that you can hit, and then of course you can hit the little E down here. And that kind of got me fooling around, wondering, oh, what can I create with that? Now, I'm a big fan of the Brazilian choro form, which, uh, if you know the composer Piche Guinha, you can Google that. And it's a form that fuses the European classical harmonies, like of Bach, with the folk rhythmic traditions of Brazil. So I took this initial sort of idea, this first measure right here, and thought, well, what if we made a choro based on that? Now, so I said, how am I going to expand upon that? I have the E to the D sharp, and one thing that I love uh, about Spanish music or Bach classical music is 
this sort of sidestepping that occurs with a half step. And I also love using what we call kind of wrong notes, like this D sharp, this dissonant note. I love half step movements. Can you guys hear me okay? Give me some feedback. Or is this too loud? Is it, it looks like it might be distorting. I can actually see your comments. So is the Mevo that's picking up the... Let's see there's five of you watching. Now you're down to four. So <clears throat> I've always been interested with the, with the half steps. So, and then going to this D natural. So when we start the piece, actually if I take out the first measure and this little doodle section that I was doodling around with on the couch, we don't really know what key it's in. There's an ambiguity to it. And it's one of the things that I love about classical composers is they mess around with, they, you know, you think you're at home and then they'll throw you off into another key area. So I thought to myself, okay, let's mess around with this D sharp. So I actually made a conscious decision, this D sharp to E, and then, well, what if I go from D sharp down to D? And of course, that sets up a, the movement of a dominant chord. Now, we don't know if it's major or minor, if we're looking at it right there, you know, because if you notice, I haven't, I've got a B, I don't have any indication. It could be E major, right? But when you hit that F natural, most likely that F, your ear hears that as being in a minor key. Okay, and so I really like that, what we call that flat two there, which is very popular in Spanish music. So I'm just talking a lot, you, a lot of you may not realize how much goes into writing a piece of music and how much thought we put into every single note. Uh, but when I make this movement down from the D sharp to the E to the, to the D natural, now I'm really outlining what? A uh, dominant seventh and E dominant seventh chord. And now when we hit this, now we're clearly in A minor. If you look. Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's back up. Another thing that's great about the choro form is that you could play any of these choro pieces. This is an original one that I wrote. But you can play a choro, you can play the melody, and the melody itself will have a sense of the chordal structure. You can play it a cappella. And that's the one thing that I love about great melodies, is they don't need any accompaniment. Everything that you need for that to exist on its own, the melody is going to have the rhythm, the harmony implied, and just a beautiful sense of contour. So I already said to myself, Will, if you're going to do this choro, you need to make sure, one, that this, that this melody can stand on its own. So, so if I just play, starting from the top right here, yeah, it's not really singable because it's kind of all over the place, but I could just play it. So if you notice, it already has kind of a feel where it can stand on its own. or it, it, It's outlining E, so A minor, so it's a 5 to 1. Now how much mileage can I get out of the 5 to the 1? And how many other keys can I explore? So we're going 5-1. Now you notice this first part of the, of the melody, so we call phrases. This first phrase is done this way. Now when I come back to it, I start up from the A minor. If you notice at the top, I'm starting here and going down. So I'm creating some variation. It's basically the same idea. This idea, this idea, the same. Now, when I come up to the bar one of the phrase that we did earlier, instead of hitting a B, I go to a G sharp, just to add some variety. And then I go up to the B. So it's kind of like a mirror image of this other phrase, okay? <laughs> but it's basically the same thing. Your ear kind of hears the same idea. Now, here's a really thing, interesting thing that's very popular in classical music and choros is so we, it sounds like we're in A minor, right? Here. Now, I want to hit this. That C sharp, all of a sudden, is telling the ear, okay, we're going to the four chord. Okay, D minor right here. So, when I wrote this melody out, I thought, oh, okay, it sounds it's very popular. Now, if you notice, when I go to the A over the C sharp here, let's listen to the chord change. There's A, so. Now, I've got a G flat in here. 
all right? So I'm already taking that idea that I set up here of half steps and playing around with it. Where else can I keep that half step idea going in the melody, okay, but still make it work? And also, can this melody still work on its own? So here, without any chords, okay? And what I'm doing is, is I'm, when we get to the A, all right? It sounds like we're in D minor when we, lock, when we land here. All right? Now, what is the relative major of A minor? Right here, we're in A minor. Basically, all this section is in A minor. And then we hit an A, which is what we call a five of what? It's a five of the D minor. So in A minor, it's the four chord. But in C major, that would be the two chord. So, so we're going from the A here again. Now this is, when I hit that G, that's really making that a dominant sound. Now in jazz, this G flat, the, when you go, when you take a dominant, you flat it. That's a really popular voicing there, going, not voicing, that's very popular voice leading. Going to the D minor, and then now I'm hitting the G, so by hitting the G7, going up to the third, now we're like, what, per firmly in C. So it feels like we landed in C, so let's take it from the A, so we go. If I just stop right there, that sounds like the four chord, right? I could go this, and then, and then five, and then one, but I don't. I saw, all of a sudden I make that D minor a two. And then I'm playing with, the, again, the half steps. The half step movement. Now we're in C, right? And then here's this G, G flat thing that we had earlier. We had it up here in octave. Now we have it down here. So I'm repeating something, but I'm using it in a different chord, in a C chord. Going to the F. So if we're in C here, that would be going to the four chord, right? Now here's where I do a little side stepping. Looks like that that mic might be a little hot. Let me. Let me change that here. Sorry guys, anybody have any questions? All right, let's see, let me turn that down a little more. Okay, all right, so now we're at the F here. So, so we're at G, G flat, F, and now when we get to the F sharp, that should actually be F sharp minor seven, seven flat five, okay? Going to B seven. Now, I, I still wanna keep, having this half step idea going on. So when I go F sharp minor 7 flat 5 to B7 here, look what's happening in the melody. So let's check it out. Here's the F sharp minor. Where do you think I'm going? Okay, now we're, we're going to D7. Now see that? That's a lower neighbor of the fifth of B7. So if you just played that, that would be like a B7 augmented, right? On that note with the G. And then it's resolving down back up and then we land in a new key of E minor but I'm holding that F sharp kind of like Chopin would do holding that F sharp over as what we call a suspension over this E and then playing with the half step again just like there's that E to D sharp which is the same up here I might be going really fast you can stop this later but notice this okay let's go back here this is a two five one so by I sidestepped, we were in C here, then I go to the four chord, the F. Anybody can argue with me if they think it's different, but <laughs> this is, feel free to put your comments below. So we're, we're landing on the four chord on the F, and then just by going up a half step, literally moving the bass note up. F sharp, that should be F sharp minor seven flat five. Now we're starting to move to the key of E minor. Play this. Sounds a lot like Chopin, right? Now, now we've got E, D sharp here, but check it out. What if I were to take the bass line and now put that, make that an E over D? I thought, well, wait a minute, that would get me back to A minor. So, so we got the E minor here. I'll just play the chords and not the melody. Watch. Very popular kind of progression with Bach, right? So here's the melody with it. Ready? If I just play. D, 
again, I've got the D sharp going to the D, which is similar up here, D sharp D, see that again? That's being expressed, so a lot of the same kind of ideas are being expressed, so the ear picks it up and goes, oh, that sounds familiar to me. Now I'm back to what? A minor here, over C. And the reason why I put A minor C is what? Why do you think would I go E over D to A minor over C? Because in classical music, stepwise motion is always preferred. Or is, is a popular thing. I don't know if you say it's always preferred, but let's just listen to this. This was just uh, E over D, and then A minor over C. Isn't that beautiful? As opposed to... That's another way to do it. But what I was trying to do is make a nice little scale-wise bass line. So the bass line starting here, E, D, C, and then here's this back to that C sharp, A over C sharp, right? Okay, so let's look. Let's, let's go back here. So we're back. When I hit here, we're in E minor, but now we're going back to A minor, right? I changed that to a five chord. Now we're back in A minor, right here, and I'm playing with that little Spanish thing again. This flat six, F, da, da, da. and then I'm not going to let you stay in the A minor that long. We're going to go to a five of D minor. Right? And then I'm going to actually repeat the last uh, several bars. That's a one, two, three. It's a five bar phrase. When the musicians play this, they're like, oh my gosh, five bar phrase. One, now if I, were, if I wanted to make it a five bar phrase, it would be one, two, three, four, five. But you notice I, I didn't do that. So, but I took the, basically repeat back to here. If you notice this bar and this bar are the same, this bar and this bar are the same. But I make a little shift, instead of going to the F sharp minor 7 flat 5 on the next bar, I make my way back another way by going back to A minor. And I used a little device here called the Neapolitan 6th chord. So it's all about, you know, kind of balancing ambiguity. Where are we? What key are we in? Where are we going? And having fun with this half steps. The half steps in here. Okay, so let's go backwards here, this A minor. I'm just going to play the chord progression. A minor, C, and then sharp going to D minor. Now, so it sounds when we hit there like we're in D minor, but when we go to the G7, now we're, no, we're not in a D minor, we're really going to C, right? Here's C. And then right, that's one chord, and then four chord. But that's almost saying like, maybe that's going back to A minor a little bit. Now when we hit this, B flat, over D, right? Kind of sounds like Beethoven, right? I'll talk about that in a minute. To this, to the E7, to the A minor. Now, if I wanted to be really silly, I could actually, there's a number of sidestepping things I could do. I went B flat over D to E to A minor. What if it's, what if I'd written this? Let's start here from the C. C, F, B flat over D. I could go like this. What? That's what we call the Picardy third. When you, when you're telling your listener you're going straight for an A minor resolution, and you raise the third, and you end. That's very popular in early music. They didn't want to have this ending. So, so anyway, back to let's talk a little bit. Just the chord progression. Forget the melody. Okay. So to review, you can see these two bars here are the same as these two bars. So a little repetition. There's no need to create new things all the time. You can just repeat. A lot of times, take your melody, repeat the melody with different chords is another way to do it. And like you said, the, or like I said, the convention I set up here of the half steps, you know, being used all over the place, is I'm using that all over the place. Taking the half steps, using them all over the place. Okay, so uh, back here. So we got D minor to G, to C is 1, F is 4. Now what the heck is this chord? When you hit that, it's like, whoa, we are in some other universe. What this is, is it is in the key of A minor, when you play a chord in first inversion based on the flat two. So let's, let's, let's go back and figure that out. So we're in A minor, A minor would be one, and then normally I would have the second chord in A minor would be a B, based on the second degree, it would be natural, it would be a B diminished, so if we flat that B to B, B flat, it sounds like that. 
I sure hope you guys aren't getting distortion because I keep looking up occasionally and it's uh, looks like it's distorting. Let me get that out of there. Hold on. Let me turn it down yet again. Anybody want to give me some feedback on the sound levels? Okay. Oh, I realized I'm getting down. I need to pull this down a little bit. All right. So let me go back here in case you missed it. We got C, F, B flat over D to, to E, the 5, to A minor. So the B flat over D is called a Neapolitan 6 chord. The reason why that is, it's built on the flat 2 of the minor key you're in. So if you're an A minor, it would normally be B. You'd flat the B to be, make a B flat chord. And then you put it in first inversion. So that's where you get the Neapolitan 6 is the is this sound right here, the D to the B flat. That's why they call it the Neap Neapolitan 6. Okay? And then we go, in, and the Neapolitan 6 sixth usually precedes the 5 chord of the key you're going to. So we got, there's the E7, right? Going to A minor. Now if I wanted to get really fancy with this, I could make this a suspension. Check it out. Let's see what that sounds like. So we got the B flat over D, Neapolitan 6 chord. And I could do this. That's a D minor. So I'm suspending, the, but I didn't do that. Okay, now back to my idea again, when I said earlier that you want the melody to express the harmony. So let's see if you can hear, let's just play the melody here, what's going on harmonically just through the melody, right? So let's play the melody here, so. What I did was is I included some notes. So this one, let's look at this melody right here, just, just in terms of what is it doing. It's arpeggiating C, so the first three notes, all right? Arpeggiating the C major triad. And then I'm getting on an off, on a, um, a beat, a note that's on an upbeat. It's not on a downbeat, it's not on a strong beat. I'm using it as a passing tone, which is very popular in bebop, to have the downbeats be a strong part, so you see that first one's the third, that's the fifth, and then on the upbeat, I'm leading to the root of the next chord. Now check this, that E is a what? What is that? It's the major seventh. And then when I hit here, when the bass, if you put the bass in there, and I'm, so this E going to D is like a little bit of a suspension. And when it hits this B flat, you really know there by hearing that B flat that it is a Neapolitan because it's got the flat too. And that, that also resolves to the A, which is a half step above the G sharp. So even if you didn't have the bass in there, you'd hear a really strong five feeling. G sharp, E, D. Like for instance, what if I went G sharp, F, so that would be another option I could do. Let's listen to that. It's from here. I'm changing the E to F. It's a little weirder, so I kind of chose to go to the E. Now, that's through the whole, that's just the A section of the tune. Let's see if I can get down a little further here. I see there's two of you watching. How, how's it going out there? How's it going out there? I'm going to slow down a bit. Okay, so we went through this Neapolitan 6 thing. G sharp, E. Dominant seventh, leading down to the third, which is foreshadowing A minor anyway. You notice, like over here, there's no nothing with the flat at third from A minor yet until right there. So if I just play this with a bass line, another good way of testing your melody is to play it with just a bass line. Let's see what it sounds like. Now, another thing I'm looking at is, instead of having an F on the downbeat, that's duplicating the bass. You know, I might have tried something different, like, how about this? What if I went C, and I wanted to create a stepwise bass line? What, I, what kind of things could I do there? So, I'm going to come off the C, so... I could put an A, and it would create that real classical sounding chord. So, that might have been a better choice. So 
I just right now showing you this realized that I actually could have created a better chord progression there. But I've already had a lot of inversions over here, so I kind of wanted to take a break from having so many inversions back here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me pull it up a little bit. There we go. So I wanted to kind of stay in root position for these two measures. But I could have done an F over A so that that melody wasn't duplicating the bass line. We want to use our landscape as best as possible, musically speaking. All right, so we're through the this whole section right here. Let me just show you this real quick. Let me open it up a little bigger. All right, this whole section is the A section of the tune. Now, in a lot of these tunes, the next section will immediately go into the relative major. So I just made a decision. I'm like, I'm going to go to the relative major. So we ended in A minor. Now, I just go right into it. So the band's going to go. So the next section here <laughs> in B, and I'm, upon further thought, I'm thinking like, maybe I could have had a better cool. <laughs> yes, I'm planning to do more of these. Absolutely. This is so much fun for me because it helps me learn, and I'm sharing it as well. So, second ending, I'm on A minor. So we ended on A minor. Now, how could I... There's, there's a couple cool ways I could get to C. Now, classically speaking, I'm on A minor. And guys, could you make suggestions, all right? So I'm ending the melody. I could just go to a five. I could go... Oh, sorry. I'm playing a lot of notes here. I think I might have tried that, and I was like, eh. I could go to a tritone substitution. I could play a D flat going to C. Uh, what other what other options? How, how can I get from A minor to C comfortably? I could okay. So this melody note that's really outlining obviously a five chord. All right. Now I could go. So I could go. If I wanted to do a tritone substitution. That means that would be a half step above this at C. Why is that? Because if I were normally playing a G7, so if I just played a G7 on that downbeat of that quarter note, what would that sound like? So there's the C. Oh, I'm sorry, I was playing a, a C, sorry. Okay. That actually sounds pretty cool. So I might want to put a G there, actually. There's not a pen around. Hang on one second and grab a pen. And I have a gig with Ulrich later. Does anybody tell me what time it is? So this could be a G. To get us a little more smooth, smoother over to C. Okay, let's see. Alright, so uh, A minor, second ending. Excuse the bad piano playing, sorry. So we got A minor. If I wanted to play it really simple, you know, diatonic in the key, that's what it would sound like. If I wanted to make it a little more interesting, how would that sound? Let's say instead of A minor, I ended on an A minor 6. So that's going to have the F sharp in there. Again, that's going to help us with the, with the half step convention that I set up earlier up here. So if, let's just play the last little bit here of the melody. I'm just going to play it with the chords. And that kind of gives that, you know, this kind of Cuban feel to it, right? I know, D, okay, D flat 7 over F. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That would be kind of weird because you have to... So what I was thinking is I go to A minor 6, right here. So, duh. Now, that, now I've got an F sharp in the 6, which then goes to the... G. That kind of sounds interesting. We've got the half step, so I'm kind of recomposing this. Now, if I wanted to make a real chromatic, yeah, the D flat 7, instead of G7, so I have two, I could do G7, D flat 7, C, or I could just somehow, what if I did a D flat here? And there's people coming up to my house now, and I do not know who they are. Well, maybe they're not having anything to do with me. Okay, they don't have anything to do with me. They're passing through. Okay, uh, so back to the A minor. So I'm ending on an A minor 6, trying that out. And I like that because, look, we've got the F sharp going to an F. 
which works great for the G, but what if I played a D flat 7, which the F would then be the third? So, two. That would, that would be the, the F. Because we're going to C. Let's try it, okay. I got the, I was playing a minor seventh in there, excuse me. So we'll play the melody again. It's always important to take these things slow. Now if I do a D flat. Nah, that's a little out for me, so. Maybe when I play it with the band, we'll try it out, but, but with this melody having a G in it, which would be what? A G, that would be a, <coughs> the G would be A, sharp 11, right? Okay. It doesn't, to my ear, it doesn't sound good. So I'm going to go for just the G7. I like this, so I'm going to change this to A minor 6. Because that, in minor, the F sharp going to the, I like that. And then maybe the last minute, I might go... Right? <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about the B section now. Alright, moving on to the B section. Now we're in the key of C, which is the relative minor of the key I started in, A minor. Okay, very popular in choros. And I'm outlining the first little bit here is just outlining C. So we're firmly established in C. And then I go to the sixth degree. Another thing that's really popular in Spanish music is the use of the sixth degree in sixths. So even if I just play this as sixths and thirds, like... So this little deal here, if I play an F under that, and then I play G flat and E flat, all those passing tones are really cool. Back, it's, it's again reinforcing the half step thing I was doing earlier. Another thing I like is I love I love taking a half step to a dominant. So this, this F here, going to the F chord, I love the way that sounds. Now we're just outlining the G7, which is the 5 of C. Okay, I'm going through this really quick. Remember, you can always stop. Now I'm at, now what I did is, on this next measure, is I made fun of, okay, wait a minute, we have, we have a dominant up here. Well, what if I, how could I make it work musically if I somehow could get an F sharp in there, right, with the G7 chord? How, you know, what are the wrong, <laughs> there are no wrong notes. There are only wrong, wrong resolutions, right? All right, so we got we got a G7 here. If you guys just tuned in, this is for musicians and students and people that are interested in learning about kind of under the hood of music, okay? So anyway, so then I got the F sharp here. If I play the... And if you notice, I got F sharp and then F again. If I play that just by itself, uh, it sounds melodic, right? Let's play the whole thing from here. So we got C, we got one chord. Five chord, five chord, one chord. Really simple. Like the top of my tune is five one. Now we got one five, <laughs> right? So then we got this little half step thing, which if you put play it in thirds, it's so lovely and so Spanishy. Check it out. Right? And then if I play this, so I'm playing the E to the F sharp. With my my camera is my, looks like it's about to die. So check out more of this. I'm going to have the rest of this on uh, my patron site. I'll finish this video. I'm getting a reminder that I have to go to my gig now. But I will finish analyzing. I'm going to turn the camera to me. I will finish analyzing this and have this to share with you. If you are a patron of Strings Attached, $5 a month or more, I'm going to have all kinds of these things in the back, back uh, vault for patrons. $5 or more per month. I'll have this up later tonight, and I'll be adding more and more and more and more. And would love y'all's input, what you'd like to see. Uh, Karen and I will be trying to do, well, we're going to attempt to do one video every couple of weeks, a live video. But more of these kind of behind the scenes, under the hood of pieces of music, for those of you that are interested. So, uh, stringsattached.bandcap.com to become a patron, sustainer of Strings Attached. And this is just one of the benefits you get, in addition to coming to the house concerts. 
in addition to getting access to all of my music. Uh, I'm going to be bringing on arrangements. So if you're a musician and you want to see all the different arrangements I've done over the years, I'm going to be gradually uploading those to a library for patrons only. So let me know what you guys want to see. Let's make this a conversation of sharing. And, whoa, sorry for bumping that there. And again, thanks to Amy Nolte for the ideas on doing this. This is a lot of fun. So I'm going to have a lot of fun with this. And let me know. Share the video. Let me know what you'd like to see. Uh, check out stringsattached.org for our shows and stringsattached.bandcamp.com to become a patron. And let me know if you have any questions below. Be sure to sign up on our mailing list. And that's at um, stringsongrass.com. You can sign up on our mailing list there. Stringsongrass.com. Take your letter. See if I can turn this thing off. play a little bit before I go out. Looks like I still have a... Here's the whole piece. guys. Thanks for your support. Love everybody. We'll see you out there in, in the virtual world or at El Mercado, stringsattached.org for more information. Let's see if I can turn this thing off.